Good morning. It's a Tuesday and it's time for devotions. Certainly hope that you all had a wonderful Christmas and uh, we're looking forward to next weekend with New Year's Eve and New Year's Day and and uh, then to worship the next day. So hopefully uh, you are going to have a little time this week to sort of breathe a bit perhaps. Uh, oftentimes that's the case and uh, if so um, hopefully you will uh, be blessed in those times. Uh, the theme for the week is chosen to be God's children. And I would invite you now to join with me in the invocation. Almighty God, look upon my life and cause all darkness and doubt to vanish beneath your gaze. Look upon my ministry and banish all barriers to effectiveness and faithfulness. Fill my life and ministry with your Holy Spirit to the end that I may this day be led into paths of fruitful service through Jesus Christ. Amen. And our reading for today comes from the second, ooh, excuse me, nah, from Second Peter ver, chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Second Peter 1, 3 through 11. Okay? His divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus he has given us through these things his precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. For this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness and goodness with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with endurance and endurance with godliness and godliness with mutual affection and mutual affection with love. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, you they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For anyone who lacks these things is nearsighted and blind, and is forgetful of the cleansing of past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to confirm your call and election. For if you do this, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. <clears throat> and as we look at that passage, I mean, there's a lot there. Um, I'll pray about it and see. We may spend the week on this passage alone. Um, it, it just, there is an awful lot there, an awful lot to dig through, an awful lot to uh, understand in that and, uh, and to think about. And so it starts out reminding us that uh, it is through Christ's power, through his godly, his divine power, He's given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge that we have of Jesus. It ends with, for in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be richly provided for you. So as you, as you look at this passage, verses 3 through 11, it's bookmarked by the statement that it is Jesus himself who provides the way for us. It's not by our own efforts. It is not by any uh, works of righteousness that we might do. It is wholly dependent. Our salvation is wholly dependent on the gift of Jesus Christ. And our eternal life is wholly dependent on the gift of Jesus Christ. We receive that. It is given to us. Have I beaten the horse until it is flat? Yes. Okay. Um critical issue. So he, he bookmarks everything else that he says in here because what he's going to get into next is a, a statement about where we need to be, what kind of things we need to be doing as a result of having received the gift of salvation. So we don't earn our salvation by what comes next. And, uh, and again, you know, just really stress that this state, this statement is bookmarked by a statement that Jesus is the one who's responsible. He gives us salvation. And then in between, 
It's the kind of things we need to do to live in that salvation that has been given to us by Christ. And, and he's given it to us through his own goodness and his own glory. And, uh, he, uh, and, and what has he given us? He's given us his precious and great promises. What are the promises? Well, the promise is uh, salvation from sin. The promise is eternal life. The promise is sharing in the inheritance of Jesus himself. Uh, the promise is adoption as children of God. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and heirs with Christ. Okay? So he has established those promises. He has given those promises to us. And, um, and the purpose behind those promises and the the and result of those promises the the fulfillment of those promises is that we might escape from the corruption that is in the world and what is the corruption that is in the world based on it says because of lust now you can get lost in that real quick um he is not purely talking about sex when we when we think about lust we usually go in a direction of uh, some sort of sexual sin but for uh, for certainly for Peter and uh, and in that day the word lust was much more all-encompassing. Um, lusting was wanting something, not just not just looking at something and saying, "Boy, I'd like one of those," or "I'd like something like that," or "I'd like someone like that." Lust uh, really oriented around the idea that uh, it was it has the um, the implication of being in hot pursuit. So it isn't just simply looking at something and saying that's nice or looking at someone and saying they're attractive. It's saying, I, I'm going to figure out a way that I can get that or I can get that person. And uh, when, uh, when it is, is played out in, in a way that undermines uh, our faith or undermines our presence in Christ, I mean, there are things that are totally appropriate for us to want and get, you know, and uh, to ask for and receive. But there are things that are totally inappropriate. And, you know, we could we could sit here and play around and make a list of some sort, but it's totally pointless because we know in our heart of hearts, especially in our relationship with Christ, what the significant issues are for us and uh, and what they are in general okay so when you hear the word lust here understand this is a like going after pursuing in hot pursuit in you know almost desperation going after the things of the world and uh, and those things may cover a whole lot of territory maybe a lot of different uh, items or uh, desires but the word lust encompasses all of them, okay? So, uh, you know, it is the, uh, we are, the corruption that is in the world is because of lust. And, may, and that, uh, you know, Jesus wants to do battle with that in us. And so that we may become participants of the divine nature. So in other words, not focused so much on the things of the world, but focused on the things of God. We would become participants in the divine nature. What are the thoughts of God? What are the purposes of God? What are the actions of God? That's what we want to be thinking about. That's what we want to be pursuing. That's what we want to be acting on. And so, you know, Jesus provides us with the foundation of moving into that divine nature. He gives us room to engage in that divine nature with him. And he leads us on consistently so that we can indeed experience the nature of God at a deeper and deeper level until we are immersed in it. Um, you know, when we get to heaven... Uh, we don't know exactly what that's going to be like at all. But what we do know is we will be immersed in the presence of God. Uh, it is not impossible for us to begin that immersion even now in our lives as we seek to 
engage in the divine nature, which is our call as Christians. And God helps us to do that. So he goes on, he says, For this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith. Okay, so if we believe in the promises that Jesus has given us, and, and we are claiming them, then we need to do something about that. That our salvation is not dependent on what we do, but rather our what we do is a response in joy and, and a desire on our part. You know, the lust of the world is one thing. The, the pursuit of God is something altogether different, and that's what he's drawing a line between here. For this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith. Your faith doesn't come out of your efforts. Your faith comes out of your relationship with Jesus Christ. However, if you have faith, you want to support it. Because if you support it, it will grow. It's like, uh, have, you ever, uh, have you ever had to transplant a plant that you were growing into a bigger pot because it had outgrown the pot that it was in? You know, it, it is required of us in terms of growing to, uh, to continue to give more and more space in our lives for that growth of faith. And, and so what, what sort of things then grow our faith? And I think I'll end with the first one and we'll pick it up tomorrow and maybe finish it up. We'll see how we go. Um, so you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, I, I uh, heard the story. I don't remember the event, but uh, uh, my dad came home one day, and, and uh, I, I had been to a tent meeting when I was six, uh, and uh, there I accepted the Lord. And, uh, and people can say, well, you were only six. What did you know? Well, I knew. Uh, I did. Um, and it wasn't any huge revelation. It wasn't any huge thing that just uh, pastor was talking about receiving Christ. And, and uh, you know, if you believe, then you need to make a public profession of faith of some sort. And, uh, and it all made sense to me as, as much as it could make sense, I suppose, to a six-year-old. But it was like, yeah. And so when he did the altar call, I got up and I mean, it wasn't like I was all shook up. I was all, um, you know, uh, excited or, or this is huge or anything like that. It was just like, yeah, I want to, I, I want to make sure that, you know, that I affirm my faith in Christ. You know, I, I, I started going to church within my first month of life, um, had been in Sunday school, you know, every Sunday. Uh, I've said this before, my mom played the organ, my dad was a choir director, we were in church when the doors were open. And it was often a Stevens who opened the door, you know, kind of thing. And uh, and so, and and everybody in church, we did have a, we had a wonderful group of Christian adults. Um, it was all supported in the community within which we lived, you know. So I had been immersed in it uh, from birth. And, uh, and so when that call essentially came to say, uh, hey, if you believe this, come on up, make a statement. And it was like, yeah, I, I absolutely, I believe that. So I got up and, and I started out and my dad was, I remember I, he was on the aisle and I was in the next seat in and I got up and, and uh, started walking the sawdust trail, uh, you know, went out and, uh, and my dad said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm going down. And, and he said, okay, do you want me to come with you? And I said, well, sure. You know, I mean, church was church. There was no fear. There was no, you know, uh, it just was very matter of fact. And I remember feeling very matter of fact about it. So we got down there and, you know, we went through the process, filling out the card, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and they, uh, they asked me, um, they said, uh, is there anything else you want to put on the card? And, and I just said, well, I love Jesus. And uh, and so they put that down on the card. And I, I remember those things very clearly. Now, it was probably uh, maybe a couple months later, my dad came home from, uh, uh, he was a teacher, and he came home from school. And our house was, I mean, we were in a very small town, and uh, we had a bank above our house, a, a, you know, a, a, a hill, if you will, that was full of trees and, you know, brush and stuff. 
And I was up in there and I was, at, and my dad told me this story years later. I was sitting up there crying and I said, and he came, he heard me. And so he came up and he said, what's the matter? And he said that I said to him, <clears throat> it's really hard to be a good little Christian boy. I have no idea what that was about. I don't, I don't remember it, but I remember him telling me the story and, and he told me that story. And then he said, and that's when I knew that when you had gone forward, it really meant something to you. You know, when you had accepted Christ, that that was real. And, uh, so, um, you know, that it, it became an encouragement to me later in life. But apparently within myself, I was doing battle with this concept of being a good boy, you know, of goodness. What did that mean? Well, obviously being obedient to your parents and, you know, being obedient in school. And uh, I, I have no idea what the deal was. I don't know if somebody had said something to me that hurt me or whether I had said something and then somebody took it that way or whether I said something and hurt somebody. I don't know. But it, it must have hit me pretty hard because um, I was up there on the bank crying about it. And uh, so it's kind of an interesting, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. But, uh, you know, so when I read this, I always think back to that story, you know. And so what do you do? Well, you, you grow your faith with striving toward what is good, what is right, what is righteous. And, uh, and you know what? There are times when you're going to fail. Uh, I don't say that as an excuse for anybody, including myself, but there are times when you're going to fail. And, uh, and the wonderful thing about God is, as he says later on in the passage, you know, it's like, uh, and so we go back. We, you know, we get back into it. We don't give up in, in our attempts because... God is absolutely consistent in his interaction with us. Why do you think it bothers you after that? You know, that's God. That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, okay, let's deal with this. Let's go. Let's go on from here. And, uh, and so all those things together, you know, it, it really is a miraculously wonderful reality that we are indeed chosen to be God's children. Now, uh, you know, you can get into the whole uh, Calvinism, um, what's an Arminianism uh, argument of, uh, you know, is it is it God who chooses us or is it us who chooses God? And I think the truth lies in a manner, in the middle, in a way that neither one of us can fully understand. So we choose the part that we can understand the best, that makes the most sense to us. And God understands that, you know. But we are chosen by God. And, and from my standpoint, the whole world, every person in the world was chosen by God in the death of Jesus Christ to receive the blessing of salvation. Then we have the option of choosing or rejecting that gift. We just got done with Christmas. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we probably opened all the presents that we got. But if there was a present coming from someone that we just weren't too sure about or we really didn't like very much or... Uh, you know, something like that, um, it, you might not open that gift. You might just toss it away. And uh, it, it really is a, uh, um, a matter of us receiving the gift that God has given us. He offers it to all, every single person. And uh, it's up to us whether we're going to receive it or not. Now, that's my take on it. Um, it is not, I don't believe it's an inexorable, you know, force that forces you to make that choice. I, I don't believe that for a minute, uh, but God offers it to all. So, uh, strive for that which is good, that which is righteous, that which is pure, that which is godly. Strive after those things today. I, I think one of the, you know, I've said this before, one of the great, um, Christian, uh, uh, oh, idea, ideas that came out for quite some time was, you know, the uh, what would Jesus do theme. And I think if more of us asked ourselves, what would Jesus do in this situation, uh, we probably would come out closer on the side of goodness than we often do. So uh, 
keep those things in mind and we'll pick up there and come back tomorrow and, uh, and look at it some more. In the meantime, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.